What's going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. My voice may sound a little bit weird today, not only because I'm sick, but also because my microphone decided to die on me recently, which is why I have no other choice but to use the integrated microphone that is in my camera. And this is the sound quality that you're going to need to listen to up until my new microphone arrives in a couple of weeks. Anyways, in today's video, we're going to be discussing why AMD's FX processors were better than you remember. This is a follow-up subject to the previous video about why FX CPUs were a such disappointment. So if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to check it out in the card at the top right corner. And believe it or not, even though FX CPUs received a lot of hate and were not the best you could get at the time, they still were great processors for their price. Just a quick side note, in this video I'm not going to be talking about Bulldozer, which as we all know was a failure. I'm going to be talking about Piledriver CPUs that released a year after, which got higher frequencies, slightly lower power consumption, and were priced lower, which essentially made them a decent choice. As a 6-year-old FX8350 user myself, I can tell you that I never really needed any more than what this processor could do, as it would handle pretty much everything I would throw at it, even at stock frequencies. Only recently I decided to overclock my FX8350 to push as much performance out of it as possible, and I gotta say I'm very surprised at the amount of performance uplift that I got, which is especially noticeable in productivity workloads as well as intensive titles, such as Battlefield 5, that now run much smoother. Now yes, FX processors in general weren't so great compared to Intel's offerings at the time, but there were a few things FX CPUs would offer in exchange. Overclockability of all FX processors, more cores, and value. And just before you start talking about the FX CPUs not having the amount of cores that they were advertised at, I suggest you watching my previous video first where I explain the architecture of FX processors and feel free to also watch the whole thing to understand why Bulldozer was so disappointing. Basically, it was like this. For the price of an i5, you would get the multi-core performance of an i7. For the price of an i3, you would get the multi-core performance of an i5, etc. And so people that were looking into video editing, 3D rendering, or streaming, basically tasks that require more cores, yet still couldn't spend a lot, had the opportunity to go for the superior multi-core performance of the 6 and 8 core FX processors for the price of an Intel equivalent. Not only that, but you could also get yourself an FX8320 almost for the price of a locked i3-3250. And even though it was behind when it comes to single core, it was not that far behind the 3770K in terms of multi-core performance, while being sold for twice as cheap, which made it a great budget workstation CPU. As to when it comes to gaming, unfortunately, even the Core i3 back then was able to outperform the 8-core FX CPU in most titles. Yet, I would argue that even a more expensive i5-3450 is now incapable of delivering a smoother experience than the FX8320 in most games that released within the last 3-4 to four years. Because as you most likely know, games actually started utilizing more cores recently instead of only a couple of them, like they've been doing that back in 2012. A great example to show you how much cores matter over single core nowadays would be comparing a stock i3-7350K to a quad-core i5-6500. And even though the 6th gen i5 is behind in terms of single core performance by around 16%, it still has a multi-core advantage thanks to its 4 cores, which as we can see results in not only better frame rates in every modern title, but also slightly more consistent frame times, making the gameplay smoother overall. By the way, the frame time graph is unfortunately something that most tech YouTubers do not demonstrate, which is why I really appreciate Richard and his team from Digital Foundry using it in their CPU reviews and showing everything in real time. I'll leave a link for their channel in the description down below. Be sure to show them some love for the great content that they make. Fun fact, if you would compare an i5-6500 to an i3-7350K in games that released 6 to 7 years ago, I'm pretty sure the 7350K would also mostly beat the i5 thanks to its single core advantage, though obviously it wouldn't make an i3 a better CPU. 
Here's another great example from Digital Foundry comparing a Ryzen 5 1600 to an i5-7600K and just take a listen what Richard himself has to say. We'll start off with stock clock comparisons and why not kick off with our punishing Witcher 3 Novigrad City Test. Both Ryzen 1600 and the X are comfortably beating the stock i5. It's a great beginning to our testing here and shows that many cores and many threads can beat out the brute force single thread performance of the i5 quad. Our Assassin's Creed Unity bench is also fascinating. The i5 is seemingly the fastest chip here with a 121 frames per second average versus 116 on the 1600 and 119 on the X. So there's not much in it basically, but you'll notice something curious here. In the heavier workloads, like this initial Vista shot of the Notre Dame scene with tons of NPCs, the i5 is struggling a bit and Ryzen 5 is faster. However, in less challenging areas, the i5 pulls ahead. So there's an argument here that Ryzen is more useful in areas where the CPU is actually under more heavy stress. Those extra frames in less challenging areas, the places where the i5 is stronger. I mean, how much use are they? As we can see, the Ryzen 5 1600 pulls ahead in CPU intensive situations thanks to its 6 cores and 12 threads, despite having a single core disadvantage of 18%. While the 4 core 7600K only manages to outperform the Ryzen 5 in less demanding areas. This, by the way, does not apply just for one game, and you can see the same happening in other titles as well. And I'm pretty sure that you've still heard people say that an i5 is better for gaming, even though it clearly loses to Ryzen in some areas and has worse frame time performance here and there. And you know what's even more interesting? Not a single big channel talked about this. This is also why I'm not a big fan of benchmark bars with FPS numbers on them because they're not showing you the performance in real time, there is no frame time graph, and you're not aware of the in-game location that was used for testing. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In case you're not aware, results may vary depending on the area you're in, and in games it is very important to test a few different locations before drawing any conclusions, which is what Digital Foundry does. In this Witcher 3 CPU test, for example, we can see that all the CPUs perform identically, whether it's a dual-core G3258 or the i7-4790K with 4 cores and 8 threads, which will make most people think, what's the point of buying an i7? The frame rate is the same, and even the G3258 is able to run the game smoothly. Well, that's exactly what would happen if Digital Foundry did not include a different location of the map, such as Novigrad, where we can see a much clearer image. Even with an overclock of 4.5 GHz, the dual-core Pentium G3258 now struggles to outperform even the lower-clocked dual-core i3 with hyper-threading. Basically, even though in some areas that do not tax the CPU, the G3258 will be able to match the 4790K, in others it will not even get close to it, which is why benchmarking just one area of the game is absolutely pointless and does not represent the full capabilities of a processor. To be honest, seeing all this just made me skeptical about many CPU reviews and benchmarks that I've seen over the past 7 years, that only include charts with FPS numbers on them, because they just don't show you the whole story. So what am I trying to prove here? Basically what I want to say is that having more cores over better single core performance can sometimes be beneficial and result in a better gaming experience even in titles that released 5 or more years ago, which makes me feel like the performance of AMD's FX processors was very underestimated by many tech YouTubers. As we just saw, it's really easy to mislead people into thinking that one product is better over the other, when in reality it's actually not as good just cause someone didn't do enough testing to showcase the true performance of each product. It seems like the same thing happened with AMD's FX processors. Remember that YouTuber that told you to get an i3 instead of an FX6300 by showing you an FPS graph with the i3 pulling ahead a couple of frames? Well, the FX6300 is beating the i3-4130 thanks to its 6 cores in a game that released 5 years ago, and it's not even overclocked yet. 
Now yes, the i3 will maybe pull slightly ahead a few frames in less intensive areas, but if it dips and stutters in other demanding locations, it just doesn't make the i3 a better choice. Taking into account that games nowadays benefit much more from cores, just like we saw in the i5 versus Ryzen 5 comparison, I'm pretty sure the i3 wouldn't be able to keep up with the FX 6300 in most modern titles. Do also keep in mind that the i3-4130 was released a year after the FX6300, so it would make more sense to swap it with a 3rd gen i3, which obviously would perform slightly worse. By the way, after seeing this, would you believe that a G4560 is on par with an overclocked FX8370 to 4.4 GHz? Well, for some unknown reason, it is if you look at Steve's results from Hardware Unboxed, even though there is nearly no difference between the G4560 and the 4th Gen i3, which by the way just lost to both FX6300 as well as the FX8350 at stock. This is what I mean about benchmarking just one area. The same can be said about the 8-core FX CPUs. Comparing the 4690K to the FX8350, we can see that the i5 easily pulls ahead in simple areas thanks to its much better single core, but when it comes to more sophisticated locations that require multi-core performance, the FX8350 does not perform any worse than the i5, even with a single core disadvantage of 37%. Now obviously the 4690K is an overall better CPU, especially if you also overclock it. Though do keep in mind that it was released nearly 2 years later and was over $50 more expensive, so it would be more ideal to swap it with a similarly priced Core i5-3450 for a fair comparison. In that case, I'm pretty sure the FX8350 would easily pull ahead in certain areas and deliver an overall better experience thanks to its 8 cores, not only in older games such as Witcher 3 and Crisis 3, but also in many modern titles like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Battlefield 5, etc. that benefit from multi-core performance. Don't forget that you could also get an FX8320 for around $160 back then, which would be even cheaper than the i5-3450. Just before ending this video, I'd like to mention a few more things. The reason why I did not talk about the i5-3570K in this video is because it would always cost quite a bit more, but if you could stretch your budget and get a 3570K over an 8-core FX, I'd say go for it. Both have different advantages and are great long-term processors with an unlocked multiplier. You just had to pick one depending on your workflow. In case you could go for an i7 or had the opportunity to upgrade to an i7 later on, obviously you went for Intel. You've probably heard that Pinedriver CPUs ran very hot using stock coolers and that you had to buy an aftermarket heatsink if you were looking for an FX CPU. That's not true, and you could even slightly overclock an 8-core FX processor using the stock cooler that it came with, of course, as long as temperatures didn't go too high. By the way, the reported 62 degrees Celsius on AMD's website is nowhere near the true maximum temperature of a Piledriver processor. I've known many people that used overclocked FX CPUs for years, with temperatures reaching as high as 85 degrees Celsius, and none of them had any issues. My overclocked FX8350 gets to around high 70s under full load, and you're absolutely fine as long as you stay below that. And finally, of course, how not make an FX video without talking about power consumption. Obviously, you can't deny the fact that FX processors were less efficient than Intel CPUs. But personally, I feel like everyone made a big deal out of it, because at the end of the month, you would only pay maybe around a dollar more for your electricity bill compared to a more expensive Intel CPU. For more on that, be sure to check out Jay's video from Jay's Two Cents about power consumption of FX processors, link for which I will leave below. At the end of the day, you could play anything on an 8-core AMD FX CPU as long as you paired it with a decent graphics card, and if you could also overclock it to around 4.5 to 4.7 GHz, I would dare to say that you wouldn't get much worse performance even than that of a more expensive and newer 
i5-6400. With its multi-threaded performance and value, I can easily say that getting either a 6 or an 8-core AMD FX CPU was one of the best choices you could make at the time, as long as you were fine with the lower single-core performance and higher power consumption, of course. Alright, I'm gonna wrap it up, be sure to leave a like or share this video with the others, that would really help me out a lot, and also feel free to support me on Patreon or by simply using the Amazon affiliate links provided below. Anyways, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one.